Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Jenna, could you please call the roll? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Here. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Here. Oh, thank you. Sterner. Here. Zarin. Barber. Here. Having a quorum um, presence, I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Transportation Committee for January 25th, 2021. Uh, our next uh, order of business is approval of the agenda. Um, unless anyone has any changes or additions to the agenda. And seeing none, we will go, um, um, the agenda is approved. Moving on, it's approval of the minutes from the January 11th, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions to the minutes? Seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, so moved, Chair Barber. This is moved, Sterner. Moved by Sterner. Sterner. Is there a, oh, Chambliss. seconded by Chambliss. Thank you. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zarin? I don't know what I'm voting on, but I'm here. <laughs> Finish. Uh, we're voting we're on, on the minutes. minutes. Aye. And Barber. Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Next, we're on to our tab report. We have Mr. Dugan here today. You're on mute, Peter. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting a little. Let me, uh, Madam Chair, let me sign out and come back in. I'm getting reverberation. Okay, sounds good. We will um, skip ahead then to MTS Director um, MTS Director Thompson's uh, report, and then we'll go back to the tab report when Peter can rejoin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, uh, a couple updates. As I mentioned at our last meeting, the region will be getting some uh, coronavirus response and relief funding for transportation projects. Uh, I bring a little bit less positive news tonight. We did find out today that the amount the region will be getting for infrastructure related uh, projects is now targeted at 19 million. I believe two weeks ago, I mentioned that we thought it was gonna be 50 million. We got an update through the USDOT uh, today that we discovered. So uh, still working on what that will be, but generally these are funds that are allocated uh, to our local partners through our tab and council process. Um, from a COVID update, we continue to work with Metro Transit and uh, council on getting ready for vaccination of public transit workers. Uh, early, uh, early this week, we'll have a contract with the provider that will do the vaccination uh, of the workers, but uh, we're still waiting to hear from the state on um, the number of vaccinations and timing of when they will be ready. We're just trying to make sure that we are ready. And at MTS, we are doing the coordination point for all our direct contractors and also uh, coordinating for the suburban transit providers. So hopefully uh, uh, that begins to start as soon as we have vaccines available. In our testing in the past week, we had five positive tests uh, from our contracted workers. The last time I gave an update, we had nine in the previous week. To date, we've had identified 128 of the workers that have tested positive. Um, generally, there's a, currently around 2,000 in the workforce. So there is some turnover in that number over the year since the uh, virus started. But I think we're at less than 1% of the contracted workforce that have been tested positive. So uh, that is good news on that side. Legislatively update, we've, uh, with the session starting, the council has begun to give presentations. The House and the Senate, uh, we last week gave a general uh, update, the chair did, on COVID impacts to transit, along with a panel that included the MAC, uh, MnDOT, suburban transit providers, um, and the Department of Public Safety. Next week, we're providing a hearing to the Senate to give our transit operations and transportation 
transportation planning of overview, as well as the governor's budget, which will be uh, released, I believe, tomorrow. So we're starting those uh, hearings and, and general overviews that usually happens at the beginning of the session. So far, we have not had to testify, I believe, on any individual bills that have been introduced, but we are preparing responses to the bills that are impact the council. With that, Madam Chair, it concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Nick. Are there any questions or comments from council members? All right. I don't oh. see any. So, oh, Council Member Chambliss. Yes, I just have one question, and that is um, do you anticipate an impact uh, in having that infrastructure amount decrease? Um, or is that just going to affect how the money is ad allocated going forward? Madam Chair, Council Member, I believe, you know, originally it, this was 50 million we thought to distribute to our local partners for infrastructure. Now it is a lower number. However, the state, I think the, the overall transportation or MnDOT that is administering, that number remains at 161 million, which is the original number. So I'm not exactly sure how MnDOT will uh, distribute that funding. So we'll, we'll begin to work with them maybe some of that funding will go to the metro area, I am sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's just, I think, a little bit less that will directly come. The 19 million will come to the council to administer, and we had anticipated 50 million coming to the council for us to administer. Um, we still are getting a, a significant amount of money for transit and operations. So that, that is a separate pot of money. Um, and I believe we're at 185 or 186 million for transit in the region out of this bill, and we're still working on how to allocate that uh, between uh, Metro Transit, MTS, and some of our regional transit partners. So uh, that, that number remains unchanged for transit operations. Okay, are there additional, question, additional questions or comments from council members? All right, then we will, uh, thank you, Nick. We'll circle back to Mr. Dugan for the TAP report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, of course, honorable members of the committee, General Manager Koyster and Director Thompson. Uh, whereas most of the uh, the items that we discussed in TAB uh, in both November and December, uh, I'm sorry, December and, and January have already been pre or being presented to you as items, I will go mainly to the overview of the chair's reports and, and the different agency reports. Uh, the chair uh, noted that the Met Council uh, and TAB will be getting 51, approximately 51 million of the 166 million uh, that is uh, uh, allocated to us from the CARES Act. Also, there are new members on the TAB replacing those that have retired or, or uh, moved on. And I'm mentioning them to you because you may know, likely you may know some of them. In, in uh, uh, Chair Barber's district is a uh, Tom Workman from Carver County and Matt Uderman is alternate. And in Hennepin County, and this would be in uh, District 2 for uh, Vice Chair Chambliss and District 3 for Council Member Ferguson, Kevin Anderson of District 7 is now the alternate to Debbie Gattel. In uh, Council Member Sterner's district, uh, in Dan Keeley, the city council member from Burnsville, who's been on the city council for 14 years and the MBTA board is joining TAB uh, Metro Cities. In Blaine, but this is uh, Council Member Lindstrom, uh, Julie Jepson is a second term council member who will be on TAB. And again, in Chair Barber's district, Janet Williams, the mayor of Savage, a former council member and member of the Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon Task Force. You may also know her as she was the last, last uh, chaired the last nominating committee for Met Council member. Uh, reports from MnDOT, the CARES Act will have 160 million, will have a four year window and for the first time can be used for operational needs. And I'm sure as you likely know, but I'll just mention it, the state multimodal transportation plan, the 20 year vision 
has a website called Minnesota, Minnesota Go. Uh, if anyone, again, you, you most likely have seen that, but if, if you haven't, I would be more than happy to provide the web link. Uh, the MPCA, the, uh, to revisit the VW settlement of 43 million, uh, they are proud that they have re-outfitted 117 trucks and, 100 and, and replaced 111 school buses and 22 fast charging stations and 25 dual port stations. Uh, to refresh, a level one charging station is the kind you'd have in your garage, very basic. Level two in the middle is 240 volts, which is where the level two comes from, but that means you can do 60 mile recharge in 15 to 30 minutes. They've also put in, as I mentioned, the 25 dual port and the dual port, uh, Consider it like a fire hydrant. There's two ports on each side, and that's obviously more efficient than the single port. Uh, MPCA reported a reduction in greenhouse gases of 35 tons and particulate emissions of 175 tons in the clean car, uh, clean car of Minnesota rule comment period ends in March. The MAC again, uh, the Metropolitan Airport Commission's reported two awards, both uh, from Airport Council International in North America and the Global Risk Advisory Council, uh, noting, or not noting, but awarding them for their success on cleanliness and sanitation. Again, for your constitu constituents, they can feel very comfortable going to the airport that things are progressing well, the cleaning crews are on top and they're being rec on top of things and they're being recognized. They also won a, the Patriot Award for Employer of the Year for the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, in November, passenger traffic was down 66 percent from 80,000 versus 250 in 2019. In December, its traffic was down 55 percent, and departures are 318 versus 483 from a year before. But compare this to down almost 90 percent in April. Uh, the MAC anticipates or forecasts that full recovery will be in 2024 at progressing at 10 percent a year. And also, for, again, for your constituents, if they ask you about airport travel, uh, all TSA uh, officers are in mass up to and through August, and the, but there's no mass if they're behind plexiglass. I also want to take note in November, we had a, a, a terrific session by, and I want to take a hats off to General Manager Koyster by Katie Roth uh, of his team, also with uh, Charles Carlson on the arterial BRT tears update, a listening session from the FHWA and the FTA, and the new uh, chair of TAC, the, Trans uh, the Technical Advisory Committee, is John Solberg, the MnDOT Director of Planning, Program Management, and Transit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, thank you. Oh, Council Member oh, Sterner. Yes, yeah, yes, sir. I, I just was gonna commend uh, the report was really great and I, I know uh, Council Member Keeley would do a, will do a great, great job with his appointments and that kind of stuff. I'm really excited to see what the work he'll be doing. Well, thank you, uh, Council Member Sterner. He, he also mentioned in his brief intro, as you probably know, he's on the National League of Cities Transportation Infrastructure Committee, their Emerging Technologies and the Drone Committee. Oh boy, <laughs> I did, oh boy, okay. Uh, anyway, I've got enough challenges with the, all the UPS and FedEx and Amazon trucks in my neighborhood, Never mind drones. Uh, anyway, sorry, Madam Chair. And Jenna, thanks for helping me prepare. Yeah, thank you, um, Peter. Any other additional questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing so then we'll move on to General Manager Koistra for the Metro Transit Report. Thank you, Chair Barbara. I'm gonna leave my video off as I'm told it's not working very well today and it's somewhat distracting, so I'll just go with audio. Uh, I'll start with COVID update, and we've had a total of 359 employees now diagnosed with COVID from March through, through yesterday. Uh, this figure includes nine new cases since the committee uh, last met on January 11th through yesterday. Again, the patterns of COVID cases are really closely following the pattern that the state is seeing overall. So we saw significant increases earlier and, and that's uh, 
those those have, have uh, we've come we've settled back down into a smaller number of cases as has the state uh, reports uh, as are the state reports showing uh, metro transit bus and rail service are not experiencing service impacts due to COVID leave however the work unit who cleans the rail cars are currently shorthanded in part due to COVID school and child care leaves so starting today a contractor is going to be helping us supplement our staff efforts to keep the vehicles clean throughout throughout the service day uh, in terms of vaccines i believe uh, uh, nick had, had talked about the, the the vaccine work that's going on so i won't i won't repeat that and then ridership remains steady from past reports it really hasn't changed much over over this period of time we're still not encouraging riders to come back to transit because we've committed to following health guidance in that regard, health community health guidance. Uh, I will say that there's not been uh, uh, any uh, studies that have shown that transit is particularly more uh, a more a more uh, less safe setting than other settings. But again, uh, we are trying to follow health guidance and to maintain social distancing and other precautions. It's important that we not encourage uh, riders beyond an essential essential ridership, but. Uh, we are planning for the time uh, of when we can we can uh, uh, again uh, encourage uh, riders who have left us and and put new riders and we're, we have a lot of work going on at this time planning uh, planning the rollout of returning back to normal we're hoping to, to see the light at the end of the tunnel on this but ridership is down still down 60 percent overall in the system um, and, uh, and of course, that again, that still varies by type of service. Uh, uh, certainly, commuter express service, whether it be North Star or or bus, is is, is performing much worse than uh, than than local services are. And uh, it's been the same pattern throughout the COVID period. It really hasn't varied more than about five percent uh, since this all started back back in March April uh, period. Um, in terms of mass compliance, uh, uh, the police department reports that they are seeing about 78% based upon their compliance checks are seeing about 78% of the riders on light rail complying and wearing masks. This has been improving steadily. The last review by, by uh, bus operations er earlier this month uh, showed about 92% of bus riders uh, complying with, with mask requirements. I think you know, one hypothesis for the difference is that there is a bus operator uh, in the in the same area as the as the as the riders, and in in uh, on light rail, the bus operator the operator or the light rail operators in the cab. So there's not that presence uh, there that that, that perhaps uh, uh, reminds people who don't naturally want to wear a mask to wear a mask. Um, the only other item I have to report on is the Transit Information uh, Center hour changes beginning February 6th. Our Transit Information Center hours will be changing. Uh, Transit Information Center representatives provide customers with trip planning, route, and fare information, and general information regarding uh, general transit, the general transit system. Uh, over the past several years, calls to the Transit Information Center have fallen significantly. Uh, while the demand, as you can imagine, for technology-based customer services has greatly increased. So this change will allow us to reallocate some resources to more efficiently serve transit customers going forward. Beginning February 6th, the TIC will close one hour earlier on weekdays uh, at 8 p.m. and will no longer be open on Sundays and holidays when we had, uh, as you can imagine, our least number of, of calls. Our data shows again that these are the least busy times for the center. Uh, even with these changes, the Transfer Information Center will be open 6.30 to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, and from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, the Transfer Information continues to support a number of tools uh, si and systems that are available 24 hours a day to people. And I believe you will be getting a, a much more complete report on this in our coming meeting. Uh, by Bruce Howard, who heads that area. So you'll you'll get more and better information than you're getting from me right now. So uh, that's all I have to report. I may just mention that that I believe once the budget is released tomorrow by the by the um, 
governor, it, the plans are for uh, the chair to send an email to all council members providing some of the details behind that budget. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll, I guess, stand for questions. Thank you, Wes. Um, are there any questions from council members? Council Member Zarin? Hello. Uh, yeah, this is Council Member Zarin. Uh, I don't know if my video is working uh, at the moment here, but uh, um, um, Mr. Koistra, you alluded to the studies that are, are have been uh, conducted on transit and um, in the, the pandemic. Um, I, I just would, uh, in future, like a little more detail on what those studies were, and if you could send uh, some literature out to the council members on that stuff, I would I would really appreciate it. I don't really need you to, you know, expound on that. I know it's an ongoing thing, uh, but as that information comes to light, um, could you get that to us, please? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Zurn. Um... Certainly will. I, and a part of it is the lack of studies that demonstrate uh, that that transit is exceptionally unsafe. But I, I raise that. I will do that. But I, I just to clarify, I raise that because uh, we walk the line of trying to be honor uh, uh, community health, uh, you know, instruction, and that's really important for us to do in the pandemic, and not not wanting our customers to feel that transit's unsafe. That's a hard line to draw, and we're trying to do the best we can because we have customers who require our services, and uh, and we're trying to do the in part by by discouraging other ridership for those that really need us. It makes it a safer environment. But I will certainly try to get you what we can, what we have in terms of those studies, Council Member Zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions or comments? All right, thank you, Wes. Then we'll move on to our next business item. The first item of business we have is approval of the consent agenda, uh, or the items on consent. Um, I've entertained a, a motion to approve the items on consent. Barbara, this is uh, Representative Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Sterner, is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, uh, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the items on consent are passed. Next, we move to our next business item, business item number 2021-11. It's Metro Mobility to Mad West and East Zone contracts. We have Christine Cunning here. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay, Madam Chair? Yes, we can. Great. Well, it's, it's great to see, to see everyone. This is, I think, the first time I've presented to this committee um, working from home, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I was here, I believe, about a year ago uh, presenting uh, a recommendation to award our cell zone contract. Um, I'm here today to uh, present the business item to award now our demand west and east zone contracts. Um, so the business item will cover both, both zones. They both come to a term this year. So as background, as you all know, Metro Mobility is um, a demand response public transportation service for riders who cannot use the regular route system due to a disability or health condition. It is service that is governed and regulated by the um, ADA and the FTA and um, the state of Minnesota statute. Metro Mobility demand service uh, has three geographic zones, the Metro West, the Metro East, and the Metro South zone that are served by providers under separate contracts. So um, the West and East zone contracts each terminated this year, it will terminate this year in June and August respectively. Um, and these contracts will provide a continuity of services for the entirety of the Metro West and East zones. Um, 
as rationale for the contract award, uh, the council did uh, solicit for bids uh, in compliance with council policies and procedures. Um, each pro your proposers were um, invited to submit proposals for each of the west and east service zones, um, but for purposes of service continuity, a single provider would not be awarded both zones and all providers understood that at the pre-bid conference. Two proposals were received for the West Zone uh, and we have evaluated by a five member panel consisting of staff from Metro Mobility, MTS Contracted Services, Washington County and the Minnesota Council on Disability. One proposal was received for the East Zone and evaluated by the same five member panel. The panel evaluated and ranked all technical proposals based on the following factors, uh, the quality of the proposal, qualifications and experience of the proposer, and overall compliance with the RFP. The panel also identified, or excuse me, evaluated the financial submittals and cost proposals for each zone. For the West Zone, transit team had the highest rated financial submitted submittals, a highly rated technical proposal, and the lowest proposed cost for the West Zone. The pricing is within the budget and appears to be fair and reasonable. Additionally, transit team's proposal demonstrated a strong approach to customer service in a paratransit environment and a strong workforce retention program. First Transit was the only proposer for the East Zone. Their technical proposal, cost proposal, and financial submittals were evaluated and determined to meet and in a number of areas exceed the requirements of the RFP. The proposed pricing is within the budget and appears to, be, appears to be fair and reasonable. Additionally, First Transit demonstrated a strong approach to small, small business inclusion and reducing barriers through its proposed subcontractor, Sun Transit LLC. Sun Transit is a Minnesota-based firm included in the council's MCUB program and a certified council certified DBE who will be providing utility services such as fueling, bus washing and janitorial services for the East Zone under this contract. So with that, I will go up to the um, proposed action, um, asking that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a contract with Transit Team Incorporated to provide the Metro Mobility Demand West Zone service from July 1st, 2021 through July 30th, 2026 with an option to extend one additional year in, a, in an amount not to exceed $203,188,899, and that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a contract with First Transit Incorporated to provide the Metro Mobility Demand East Zone service from September 1st, 2021 through August 31st, 2026, with an option to extend one additional year in an amount not to exceed $163,578,272. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from council members? Okay, I'm seeing and hearing none. I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-11. Chambliss makes a motion to approve. Moved by Chambliss. Is there a second? A second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Zirin's aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now. Uh, on to our next uh, business item is business item 2021-20. It's the Minneapolis Bus Garage Independent Testing Agency contract. We have Carrie Desmond here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Council Members. Um, today, we're going to cover two items here. The first is business item 2021-20 for a contract amendment for the independent testing agency contract supporting construction of the Minneapolis bus garage, as well as an update um, of what's been going on on the construction site since work began last spring. Next slide, please. 
So a little project background and history. Um, this new bus garage is on the same campus as the Haywood Bus Garage and Haywood Office um, building. We're currently projecting opening the facility in early 2023, and it's approximately 350,000 square feet. I like to think of that as um, about four of your average family size grocery store, just for context of kind of how big this facility is. It's projected to have capacity for approximately 200 buses with full maintenance service for those um, for daily functions like fueling, washing, et cetera. And is also anticipated to be providing currently about 300 construction jobs as well as over 400 um, jobs once it opens and is at full capacity. Next slide. So brief review of kind of where we've been and where we're headed on this project. It's, it's been in various stages of development for quite a while now, beginning in 2006 with land acquisition activities and as early as 2009 with some of the early site preparation and demolition work. We began construction in the spring of 2020, and it's about a two and a half year um, construction schedule to build the overall facility. And then we've also got a few projects um, that I'm categorizing as future right now that we're in some of the early planning stages for. So renewables and um, some resilience measures in the form of solar and battery storage for the facility, as well as um, provisions for adding electric vehicles to the fleet and charging at this facility. Next slide. So we'll walk through a, a quick progression of some photos over the last several months of what's been going on on site. So we'll start with May 2020 when the contractor broke ground and you can see a wide open site as uh, some of the, the machinery was mobilizing with the Haywood garage in the background and the city of Minneapolis skyline, just for some context. Next slide. Things quickly got very busy on the site um, with a lot of earthwork moving around the site to level it, get it to the correct elevation. You can see in kind of the middle of the site where the Bassett Creek stormwater tunnel runs under the site and the special foundations around that beginning to take shape, as well as you can see some of the steel pipe piles stick, starting to stick out of the ground, showing different areas where they were working on the building foundations in some of the early months. Next slide. So as we progress into the fall here, it, it, um, as I look at these photos kind of in time lapse, it seems busier and busier every time we look at them. But again, you can see some of the similar activities progressing with pile coming out of the ground, the perimeter of the building starting to take shape. Um, there's a concrete pump truck in the middle of the site working around the storm tunnel. And again, just a lot of activity going on on this site. Also in September, um, towards the end of that month, is when the rainwater storage tank, which will be used to help with the bus wash cycle and, and saving potable water, also arrived on site. Next slide. So as we get into September, I mentioned at the beginning where you could see kind of the, the outline of the Bassett Creek stormwater tunnel, but these structures um, here that look somewhat like a, a bridge foundation is actually the outline where the tunnel goes under the site. So we've got a special set of foundations spanning the creek to hold up the bus garage that works in tandem with the pile driving foundation. Next slide. And then as we get to December, it, you start to see the operations portion of the building taking shape. Um, so the steel structure you see in the right photo is actually the footprint where the space is for the bus operators, their break room, um, training facilities for them, as well as offices for operations will be located. Next slide. And then finally getting to early this month, um, precast erection started right around Christmas time, and so the wall panels are starting to take shape again in that early um, portion of the building where operations will be located, as well as in the photo on the left, you can see the precast framing starting to take shape for the, the remainder of the bus garage where bus storage will be and employee parking will be. Next slide. 
So just a, a few statistics on some of the things that have happened throughout um, the last eight months or so on the site. We were able to finish pile driving in early December with approximately 60 miles of steel pile put in the ground to support the structure. So just for context, um, that's about one and a half times the length of the North Star Line. Or if you were to take every bus in Metro Transit's fleet and park them end to end, it would be about seven times the length of our our fleet of buses, so a pretty dramatic amount of pile to support this building. And the photo on the right is one of the construction crews celebrating that they got to the end of that milestone with no injuries or safety incidents, which was pretty impressive. Um, we also had to pump over 22 million gallons of water off the site to excavate below the structure for the Bassett Creek stormwater tunnel to build the foundations for that portion of the building as well as um, excavate for the rainwater storage tank, which is about 33 Olympic swimming pools. So quite a lot of water coming off of the site to make way for the building. And then substantial removal of soils off-site as well that were found to be not suitable for foundation. So originally we were anticipating um, pretty minimal quantities of soil having to be removed off-site, but ultimately once we started digging, there was quite a lot of debris in the soil and other things found that made them unsuitable to go back into the foundation, or the, the earth surrounding the foundations, excuse me. Next slide. I wanted to highlight a few of the um, particularly early work going on with sustainability features for the building. I mentioned the rainwater storage tank, so that's part of a partnership with the Mississippi Water Management Organization um, to put in a 40,000 gallon rainwater storage tank, and you can also see in the lower right photo part of the filtration system that'll filter the water being collected off the roof of the building so that it's suitable for use in the first two cycles of the bus walk. We're anticipating that'll gallons in a typical year of potable water for washing buses at this facility. I also highlighted some of the um, features that'll come later in the project. The geothermal system's currently going in um, as part of the pile foundation system, and that'll be used to heat and cool the operations portion of the building. Next slide. So with a review of the budget, um, we're currently at a $160 million project, including some of those future elements that I mentioned that are included in the 2021 to 2026 CIP for design and construction of some of the building um, resiliency and electrification efforts. And we're approximately um, a little more than 50% local funding right now, with the remainder primarily being federal sources. Next slide. For the construction contract, we have a 15% DBE goal, and the joint venture um, that's the prime for construction has 20 different DBE subcontractors on the team, ranging from some of the dewatering efforts I mentioned, as well as um, hauling off-site and a variety of other different um, services, including a lot of the finishes that will come later in the project as we're getting into the building interior. And then for the independent testing agency contract, which is the subject of the business item for today, um, they have a 10% goal. They're currently um, coming in a little bit ahead of that goal, actually, with their DBE subcontractor that did a lot of the pile driving observation for the 60 miles of pile that went into the ground, and they'll be helping with um, some of the concrete work as the project progresses as well. Next slide. So specifically for business item 2020-20 for today, the subject of that is for additional services for the independent testing agency contract. Um, with the extensive amount of water that needed to be pumped off site, as well as soil monitoring and pile driving oversight, um, some of these items came in higher than projected before construction. So I mentioned that we are anticipating less soil needing to be hauled off site, and our ITL contractor was instrumental in day-to-day -day looking at the excavations, what was coming out of the ground, and helping us figure out what could be 
placed back in um, as and deeper in some of the excavations as well to minimize as much as possible how much soil had to be hauled off site. They're also helping with the pile driving oversight to make sure that our foundations are meeting structural criteria and the um, pile lengths came in about 11% over what was projected during design. So that resulted in the need for additional oversight hours from those labor forces. Um, they've been very helpful, as I mentioned, in helping us with cost control measures and trying to minimize as much as possible some of these added construction costs. So the added services on the consultant part is, is saving us dividends when it comes to overall construction costs. Next slide. So with that, the proposed action for today is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to execute a contract amendment with Braun Intertech Corporation not to exceed 315000 for a total contract value of $1,325,398.64. For additional independent testing laboratory services for the new Minneapolis bus garage. With that, Madam Chair, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from council members? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve the. Oh. I just had one, might be a, a dumb question, but I'm just uh, wondering when we dewatered the 22 million gallons. Where exactly that water go? I mean, well, the sewer water, a few of us are on the environment committee, so I thought just to get an exact uh, answer to that. Madam Chair, Council Member, that's a, a very good question and something that Braun was able to provide a lot of expertise and help us find the bus source. So it was a mix of discharge into the city um, stormwater system as well as the environmental services sanitary system depending on water quality testing that was performed on site. So if it met um, criteria that it was safe to discharge into the storm sewer, we did that. And if it needed to be treated, it got discharged into the sanitary. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, any additional questions from council members? All right, then I entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-20. Cummings moves approval. Moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Fredson, I'll second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zarin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Next, we're on to business item 2021-21. Um, it's Bully Boulevard Reconstruction Anoka County Joint Powers Agreement. And um, I believe it's, is it Marilyn Porter who will be presenting? Uh, good afternoon, Carrie Barber and council members. Uh, my name is George Sarenberg, and I will be presenting today. Welcome, uh, George. I'm a project manager for Metro Transit, and today I'm asking your approval to allow the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a joint powers agreement with Anoka County. Uh, you'll see on the image here the entire extent of the uh, Foley Boulevard construction project. I've got some other slides following this that provide a little bit more detail as uh, to the work that's actually going to be done on council property. Uh, I think the important thing uh, that you should know about this project is that it is a zero cost uh, uh, proposition for the council. Um, on the bottom of the image, you will see Highway 610. Uh, to the left, you'll see East River Road. On the right is Spoon Rapids Boulevard. And of course, the uh, yellow uh, line that goes uh, through the middle of the image is Foley Boulevard. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the details of the project, and again, this is 100% uh, Anoka County. Uh, it's a $23.8 million project uh, whose principal element is to change the dangerous at-grade rail crossing um, with a uh, bridge. Uh, 
there are going to be ADA compliant trails and sidewalks along Foley Boulevard, a raised center median, improved turn lanes that'll help get buses and cars in and out of our facility, uh, improved signalized intersections along the reconstructed area. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this gives you a little bit of a detail that shows the way that the realignment of Foley Boulevard is going to impact uh, our park ride. Um, starting uh, at the top, the uh, purple rectangle shows where the new location of our driveway is going to be and also a new set of uh, traffic signals. Uh, the pink line is the new alignment for Foley Boulevard and the re blue rectangle in the middle of it is where the new bridge is going to be. Um, going down, you'll see a yellow triangle that represents the one acre piece of property that had been county right of way that will be transferred to the council and will become part of the park ride parcel. Uh, and then finally, the green line that represents the existing uh, alignment of Foley Boulevard. Um, and uh, so that, that will be eliminated uh, in uh, uh, 2022. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, as it pertains specifically to our facility, uh, we will see $1.6 million in improvements from the county. Uh, again, it's no cost to us. It will improve traffic flow for both buses and cars coming in and out of the facility. Uh, a realigned signalized entrance and exit, that is needed because the, uh, the alignment is going to start climbing toward the bridge at uh, the location of the existing entrance. We had to shift it a little bit to the uh, Northeast. Uh, we're gonna get expanded parking uh, there'll be new pavements, uh, improvements to our existing CCTV facility, uh, new lighting, uh, new boarding platform, new shelters, and of course, new improved turn lanes into and out of the park ride. Can I have the next slide? This shows the uh, areas that will be improved within our property. Uh, yellow represents the areas of construction. And uh, you'll see on the left-hand side, that one acre parcel that will be new to our property. Uh, you'll see uh, in the center of the image, the uh, S-shaped uh, driveway entrance and exit. And uh, then the other area in pink is the new boarding platform. Uh, and it shows the uh, bus only driveway that goes either back to Foley Boulevard or onto our bus only uh, ramp to inbound Highway 610. Uh, can I have the next slide? So that concludes my presentation. Uh, again, I'm authorized uh, asking to uh, have the council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute the zero cost joint powers agreement with Anoka County. Uh, if there are any questions, I can answer them at this time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, council member Chambliss. Yes, I'm curious. Um, the green part of the diagram that you showed, which um, was the old Foley Boulevard, um, is that going to be replaced by greenery or what's going to happen to that space once the alignment happens, the realignment happens? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member, um, part of that alignment will become part of the park ride. Uh, the other part of it uh, will uh, be turned into uh, uh, backyards for other uh, homes that were along East River Road. Um, so I don't believe that there are any opportunities uh, for parkland. Okay, yes, I did see that it was close to home. So that's kind of why I was curious about it. Thank you. Is that gonna change their property tax? 
if they get more yard? Uh, Chair Barber, um, Council Member Chambliss, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I, I don't believe oh. so. I've never heard that, but but I will certainly ask the question for you. I was just curious. I mean, it's not a big deal. No worries. Uh, Council Member Zarin. Madam Chair, I move item 2021-21. Uh, uh, Great, moved by Zarin. Um, is there a second? Second by Chambliss. Second by Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Barber? Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, George. Next, we Thank are you. on. Yep, have a good evening. Uh, next, we're on to business item 2021-22, Metro Transit Bus Battery Procurement for 2020. And I think we have Abel Mumba here, I believe. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Did you want to try to uh, log out and log back in? We still, we still can't hear you. Okay. Um, while he's doing that, we'll give him just a minute. If uh, my colleagues will indulge me, we'll move on to the next business item and give him a chance to get back into the movie or the meeting. All right, so we'll move on to um, business item 2021-23, Southwest LRT parcel 621 condemnation authority. Um, and we have, I think, Jim Alexander, or no, there's Robin Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'll be presenting this item, but I know that uh, Jim is on the call, so he'd be happy to take any uh, project-specific questions. But uh, I'm here today uh, to present a business item related to the real estate uh, acquisition for Southwest LRT project. Um, we'll be asking the council to authorize the regional administrator to acquire temporary easement on a parcel, uh, new parcel 621, and that is necessary for the construction of the project and also pass a resolution 2021-02 um, that authorizes the council legal staff to initiate condemnation proceedings if it cannot acquire by negotiation. So for some background on this, um, on this, um, on this business item, the council, council policy authorizes the regional administrator generally to approve real property acquisitions up to $500,000 for an individual property. Um, however, the council, the policy does not authorize staff to initiate any condemnation proceedings prior to uh, Metropolitan Council approval uh, or authorization. Um, back in 2016, uh, the project office presented a business item that modified that the general policy so that it was specific to Southwest LRT and that authorized the general manager and re regional administrator to initiate condemnation up to $150,000 and $1 million respectively. Um, at that same time, the council also passed a resolution declaring the, council, the Southwest LRT project as a valid public purpose for the use of condemnations proceedings. Um, and at the time that those two business items were presented, the council also passed um, the staff presented a list of parcels that were anticipated for, for um, acquisition and potentially condemnation. Um, since then, you know, uh, we did start construction on the Southwest LRT project back in uh, December of 2018, and uh, that included uh, the construction of uh, the freight rail track as well as a new track, piece of track called the Southerly Connector, which is located in St. Louis Park. And that um, is a connector track that would allow um, trains to go to Canadian Pacific's MS uh, MS line. Also, since then, so we've been clo uh, coordinating closely with Canadian Pacific, and since 
construction began, they've realized that they need additional access to that southerly connector for maintenance and other purposes. And so, uh, and, and to do that access, we need to have um, um, act property rights basically to do the grading and the construction of a retaining wall for that access point. Um, and that impacts um, an adjacent residential property. So this in turn is requiring us to do a temporary construction easement so that we can, can basically have access to do the grading and to build that retaining wall. Um, we've been working, you know, having communications with them over time, um, over, over the last year or so, and so they're aware of it. Um, and, but in the meantime, we do need to acquire a temporary construction easement. Uh, because this wasn't anticipated initially, uh, we needed to do some additional environmental work. So we did complete that in additional environmental reevaluation and submitted it to FTA. They have reviewed it and, um, and concurred uh, back in December of 2020. So it does have the uh, environmental and the FTA clearances that we need. And so now, um, we, like I said, we are um, working with the property owner, but in the, uh, in, in the chance that we may not be able to acquire the property through direct purchase, we may need to acquire it through condemnation. And so um, what we're asking for, since this property wasn't specifically called out or listed back in that action in 2016, we're um, approaching the council for authorization to include, to, um, to um, condemn or file for condemnation if necessary, and also reaffirm the 2016 resolution that the project is a valid pu public project and a val valid public purpose, and that the parcel is necessary for the project, uh, again, for condemnation purposes. So with that, I can read, let's see, the, the recommendation. Um, so the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to acquire temporary easement on parcel 621 necessary for the Green Line Extension LRT project and pass resolution 2021-02 that authorizes council legal staff to initiate condemnation proceedings if staff cannot acquire by negotiation. Madam Chair, that's uh, the end of my formal presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item number 2021-23. Cummings moves approval. Moved by Cummings. Is there a second? That's in a second. A second by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Barber? Aye. And with that, the motion carries. Uh, we're going to circle back to business item 2021-22. I believe Abel has been able to join us again. Uh, can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, I can. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I do, no I, I'm joining you through the phone now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, members of the committee. Um, as stated, my name is Abel Mumbi. I manage of contract and analysis for bus maintenance. Uh, the proposed action before you is for the Med Council to authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a contract with Batteries Plus to provide bus, bus batteries and use battery disposal service in amounts not to exceed $921,510. Um, just a little bit of a background. Uh, Metro Transit uh, purchases about almost 1,300 bus, uh, batteries a year. These batteries are used to start vehicles or to start buses and other electronic, um, component, electronic components running for the buses. Uh, procurement did facilitate uh, public bid opening on January 6th. Uh, two bids were received. Uh, the Office of Equal Opportunity did not set a, an MCAP goal for this project, uh, but in order to advance uh, the Council's commitment, providing opportunity to underprivileged businesses, procurement staff uh, contacted uh, battery uh, disposal providers to make them aware of that there was a solicitation 
as part of uh, uh, the due diligence effort. Uh, of the two bids that were received, uh, Battery Plus was a low and responsible bid. Um, and at this point, as far as uh, thri the lens of Thrive, uh, this contract will promote uh, the Thrive lens through uh, ensuring that we continue to provide transportation across race, race and economics. And the funding for this uh, project is included in the Metro Transit operating budget. With that, uh, Madam Chair and the committee members, I'll take any question you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council members? All right, um, seeing none, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-22. Chair moved. Moved by Zarin, is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Go ahead. Second by Gonzalez. Um, is there any other discussion? All right. Seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Barber? Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Abel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And once again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you. No worries. It happens to all of us these days. So uh, next we're on to our last business item is business item 2021-26. It's procurement of 26 biodiesel 40-foot transit buses. And I believe we have, um, is it Joe, are you presenting? That's correct. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joel Reichstead. I'm Assistant Director in Bus Maintenance. Uh, we are requesting the council to authorize a contract with Gillig LLC for 26 base order buses and up to 149 optional replacement and expansion buses for the amount of $13,648,091. Between Metro Transit and Metropolitan Transportation Services, we are replacing 26 base order buses in 2021 and 2022. Also, we have a potential fleet plan needs for optional buses to be ordered in, in 21 through 2023. Some of these buses may be ordered with BRT packages. In July of 2019, we started the process with a request for proposals. We ended up with five bus manufacturers and six suppliers that were registered as plan holders. The proposals were received on October 24, 2019 by two proposers. The Office of Equal Opportunity did not set a disadvantaged business enterprise goal for this project, uh, primarily because it's federally funded and requires proposals to comply with FTA DBE requirements for rolling stock. We request the best and final offer of both proposers. Gillig LLC submitted a very uh, high technically ranked proposal with the lowest baffle price of $479,852 per bus. Uh, that reflected a 1.62% cost savings over the original. New Flyer also submitted a very highly ranked technical proposal uh, that was competitive at a baffle price of $493,571 per bus, which reflected a 2.78% decrease over the original price and a 2.78% higher than the Gillig price. So we do have federal funding budgeted uh, in the 2021 through 2026 CIP for these buses. Uh, however, uh, the award and execution of contract for rolling stock in excess of 500,000 requires a council approval. So we believe this 40 foot bus contract advances thrive outcomes through the lens of promoting regional livability, sustainability, prosperity for everyone by continuing to serve residents who depend on transit, as well as residents in the region in an environmentally responsible manner. At this time, we don't have any known opposition to the proposed action. If there's any questions, I'd take those at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, council member Fredson. Thank you, Chair. I just had a question related to, to um, the uh, one of the bidders, New Flyer, right? So they, I know that they have uh, uh, facilities in Minnesota, and so you know Minnesota workers would be building these buses. Now I don't know if they make biodiesel buses, uh, uh, buses at those facilities or not, um, but I, I'm interested to know, I guess. Uh, uh, to what extent 
you know, we can factor in, in uh, those decisions as, as it relates to awarding this contract. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, they do make uh, biodiesel buses. They also make electric buses. And uh, they are a, a, a very, like I said, very competitive uh, process here. And they came in very uh, competitively on their price in a very high rank proposal. However, we cannot have any uh, geographical preference. Uh, so that does, uh, it, the uh, FTA does not allow that, so. All right. Mm -hmm. it, yep, uh, Madam Chair. And just a quick follow-up. I just think, you know, I personally think that's disappointing. Here's an opportunity where we could be uh, making an investment of Metro taxpayers' dollars and purchasing vehicles that are uh, made and built by Minnesotans, and instead, uh, Minnesota money is going to go elsewhere. But if that's um, the processes we need to follow it, then then uh, I understand. But uh, I would hope that's something that uh, 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 folks in power could change moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Council Member Sterner. Yeah, thank you, Chair Barbara. Uh, my question had to do with the sustainability and the Thrive 2040. We're looking at that, and it's estimated by 2040, the majority of the vehicles will be electric. And I'm just wondering when you're doing bids, and I know maybe it's not ready for prime time, but looking at fuel cells and electric vehicles in, in lieu of the, the biodiesel, if those are considered now, and if not now, before you purchase more of these vehicles, would you look at it then? A little bit of that thought would be appreciated. Absolutely, and uh, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, absolutely. And if um, I know we do have uh, some plans at looking at electric buses going forward, um, at this time we uh, needed to move forward as we have some uh, red line buses we need to replace in 2021. And I know MTS also has um, buses that they need to replace in 2021. Yeah. Oh, just a follow up. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about the uh, the cost differences between a fuel cell bus, electric bus, and a biodiesel bus? Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member, yes, I can um, touch on that. So um, what we've experienced before is we do have some electric buses in our fleet, and uh, the cost was uh, dependent on the, uh, the uh, overall length and stuff. We ended up about $450,000 higher, so it is it is quite an upcharge um, and that's just to move from biodiesel to electric. And then of course you have the infrastructure costs on the other side of that as well. All right, thank you very much. Right. Any ad additional questions or comments from council members? All right, um, then I not seeing no, none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-26. Council member Zarin moves. Moved by Zarin. Is there a second? Second by Chambliss. Seconded by Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Uh, seeing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zirin? Aye. Barber? Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so with that, we're done with our business items. Um, I would propose that items two through six can go on consent to the full council, if no one disagrees, with one going non-consent. Okay, all right, very good. Um, next, we're on to our information items. The first one is the 2021 um, work plans. We'll have General Manager Koistra and Director Thompson kind of run through some of these things. Um, we're gonna have more of a high level discussion similar to what we did last year where um, basically they'll kind of um, roll through it at a high level, but then we want you guys to take them offline and make sure you look at them, send comments, feedback. These are just the initial ones and we know they change throughout the year. Um, as circumstances change as well, but um, we thought we'd at least sort of get them in front of or get the proposed uh, initial work plans in front of all of you so that you can 
start thinking about other things we may want to add. So I'm going to turn it over to Director Thompson and General Manager Koyster. Yes, I, I can start, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of highlights. Uh, mine is the second part of the uh, attachment. Um, so we finished the TPP last year. We also finished, just finished the regional solicitation. Uh, so that means that our work plan and what we come before you is the start of new studies that go into the next TPP. They usually take a couple of years. Um, and um, the start of the evaluation of the regional solicitation to see what we want to change. Just to highlight, we'll be bringing forward to you a conclusion of our bus service allocation study. We'll be starting another principal arterial intersection study that prioritizes where we should build interchanges. Uh, and we have some grant, we'll be finishing our pedestrian safety action plan this year also and bringing that to the committee. Those are a few of the planning related studies that we will be uh, bringing before the committee. In terms of procurement, Last year was the big year for our big transit contracts. Uh, tonight you approved the two biggest ones, which are Metro Mobility that, um, and those contracts are, as you heard, are five year or, or a six year extended to them. So we only have one procurement this year that we'll bring before you related to transit. And that is uh, what we call the fair contract, which is for Six route contract for six route services in Bloomington, Edina, and Roseville um, that are operated through private contractors. So that will be the one transit service that is put for bid and brought before you. That, interestingly, some of those routes connect to the new orange line that will be starting later this year or next year. And so some connecting services for that. We also, uh, this is the year we need to decide uh, Vanpool. Vanpool has been dramatically impacted by COVID. Uh, down significantly the number of van pools. Um, we'll, we're hoping to see a bounce back in that, but we uh, that contract ends this year, and we'll, we'll do it. We're doing a study on the van pool program if we should be modifying that or changing it, and then potentially uh, issuing a new procurement for operation of the van pool program. Um, and, and then lastly, just to talk a little bit about some guest uh, organizations that we may be bring before the committee, and this would be. An area I'd be looking for input if there's any other ones that you'd want us to invite in. We usually have one MnDOT come in and talk about major projects. Uh, it's, it's a key point in the year. Um, we have some transitway projects that are still locally led uh, that Rush Line and Riverview are two that I'm sure you'd like to have uh, an update from the local sponsor, in that case, Ramsey County. The University of Minnesota Center for Transportation Studies will be uh, hiring a, getting a new executive director this year. And so when that person is on board and we're, they're a key partner for us and for TAB, and maybe they can come in and talk about transportation research uh, in the region and you can get an introduction to that new director. And then lastly, uh, last year we started inviting in the suburban transit providers to provide an update. And I think that went well and was well received. So I'd anticipate that we will invite them to have given information update at some point this year too. So that's just a couple highlights and um, welcome feedback and how we can uh, update that or add anything you see that you'd like updated to. And I, we can turn over to Wes or I can take questions. Um, maybe we'll pause for questions. Uh, thoughts from council members or things you'd like to see incorporated? I can say just the one one comment I had, and I don't know if it's necessarily for you, Nick, or for, for Wes, but um, it'd be good to have another uh, maybe conversation around shared mobility at some point. I'm sure that's a, uh, yes, that's a great addition to this. Yeah. yeah, I think it's good, well-timed as we're looking at the network next and the work through there of how it all kind of starts to mush together. Um, all right, um, Council Member Ferguson, did you have a comment? No, sorry. Okay, sorry, I saw you come off mute, so I wasn't sure. All right, um, all right. any additional questions or comments for Nick? All right, then we're gonna turn it over to Wes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just give a, a very high level overview as well. I think 
the most many of the items we have listed as information items here are around a lot of the capital budgets that we have going on and it's a reflection of how much capital development that we're doing and uh, southwest isn't on here because those are typically southwest lrt because those are typically provided to the full council we are certainly can provide updates here as well but uh, in the past we've tried not to duplicate it if it's going to the committee of the whole and so forth but the, many of the other projects are here orange line b line uh, gold line updates, uh, other other capital projects uh, uh, such as rush line uh, development and um, um, other and then updates throughout the year in that regard. The Minneapolis bus garage, you heard an update today, but we'll give another update later in the year. So we have a lot of capital projects going, and I think that's that's uh, there's a lot of work going on around that, and that's a lot a lot of uh, a lot of the effort. There's going to be on here certainly some budget information uh, overview. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how we're going to try to emerge out of the uh, out of the out of the pandemic, and we talk about our COVID post COVID marketing plan, um, looking at service for uh, Minnesota Quins, and we and we don't know what, whether that's going to be possible or not. We have service for for the state fair and again that depends on the on on the ability for us and the timing of emerging from the COVID environment and so there's a lot of things on here that are also going to be dependent upon uh, uh, where we're at with respect to emerging uh, from the pandemic and then there's other if there's other items on here that are a reflection of what what this council expressed interest in and uh, a, re a reflection of what past councils have, have, have expressed interest in and I'll just want to emphasize that this is just a starting point. Uh, we really do welcome hearing what you'd like to hear from us. That's important to us. So the feedback we get from you on this will be it will be important in putting together a final a final work plan uh, because we want uh, we want to make sure the information that we provide you uh, represents your policy interests and 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 supports your policy interest in this regard. All right. Thank you, Wes. Are there questions, comments from council members? Do you have thoughts? You're awfully quiet tonight. Um, so uh, I just ask that, yeah, take a look at this list and you kind of heard sort of the high level and then send any feedback to Nick, Wes, or myself or however, and we'll try and we'll, you know, try and merge um, uh, information into this um, as we go and knowing that it might change even as we go throughout the year because I think especially coming out of COVID environment, uh, we might have some both unique challenges and unique opportunities. So. Um, um, so my guess is that this will change at some point, but um, at least gives us a good framework to start the year off. So, all right, well. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and we do want your feedback. So definitely send it out to, to us. We would appreciate it. Um, next, um, our next information item is the Orange Line Connecting Bus Concept Plan. We have Cindy Herper here to present. Good afternoon, everyone. Are you able to hear me okay? I Yeah, we are. Thank you, Cindy. <clears throat> okay, great. So um, with me today is John Dillery, who is the uh, project manager for the Orange Line Connecting Bus Study. He's a senior planner within service development, um, and I am the manager of route planning within service development. And thank you for the opportunity to, to present this afternoon. Back in November, we uh, presented to the Transportation Committee about the Orange Line Connecting Bus Study that we had restarted the process, and at that time, you set the public hearing. And now we are ready to share the details about the proposed changes and then release the plan for public comment and review. Next slide, please. So first, a quick reminder of the project goals and our study area. So the map on the right, of course, shows the orange line down the middle. That's the big, thick orange line. There are 11 key routes here that are shown in blue. And these are the routes that have changes proposed. There's an additional five routes that are shown in a heavy gray line, uh, mostly in South Minneapolis. Those are routes that will also serve an orange line station, but don't have any changes proposed to them. And then all the other service uh, that's existing is shown just in the, in the background. Next slide, please. On the right is a map of the proposed route changes, which we will explore in more detail in just a minute. Since we are uncertain what the transit market and the travel demand will be when the orange line opens, we have two scenarios. Scenario A matches 
today's resources, scenario B reflects pre-pandemic level of resources. We need to make sure that the plan we implement is going to be sustainable in the long term. If demand for transit returns, we could invest some resources into scenario B. Scenario A meets our goals of replacing the Route 535 local service that's not covered directly by the Orange Line and improving connectivity between the Orange Line and the jobs, uh, Normandale Community College and other important destinations in the study area. Scenario B builds on this by improving the span, frequency, and days of the week that routes operate. And I'll now turn it over to John. Thank you. Uh, hope everybody can hear me. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, get to the details right away here of the Orange Line Connecting uh, Bus Concept Plan, subtitled How to Replace 80 Route 535 Bus Stops with 12 Orange Line Stations Retaining Riders. You can do that. Uh, here's how we think. Uh, the slide. We have next, next slide should show Route 515 and Route 7. And I uh, want to say that Route 515, is, parts of Route 515 are eliminated and partially replaced. Uh, Route 7 has been extended from South Minneapolis in the upper right corner of the map to 66th Street and Cedar, Richfield Parkway, uh, creating a connection with Route 515, 66th Street with frequency every 30 minutes, most hours daily. For the concept plan, we fill out that schedule. It operates all the time, not just non-rush hours for a more useful service. The 515 branch doesn't, uh, that goes to VA Medical Center, uh, East 54th Street does not exist uh, in this concept plan, it's partly replaced by the Route 7 coming down through that part of Minneapolis, connecting with 515. People getting to uh, VA Medical Center on the east end there are offered the opportunity or alternative of riding the 515, all the trips going down to the Mall of America now, and the Blue Line. And there's an impact I'll mention here. Uh, well, the routes have good frequency connecting at the Mall of America. It is a longer trip with a transfer at the Mall of America. In 2019, there were about 50 trips uh, or of 25 riders going to and from the VA Medical Center on weekdays. The 515 branches along Highway 77 are combined via Bloomington Avenue on the west side and via 76th Street, 77th Street, when the underpass under Highway 77 opens in 2022. There's good added ridership potential along Bloomington Avenue. As you can see, there's areas of uh, low income and people oriented to transit. There is alternative service on American Boulevard when the underpass opens. But there is another impact, that is there's no service recommended now on Longfellow Avenue, the east side of Highway 77. There's less than 10 rides per day on Longfellow Avenue, but these are mainly commuters to FedEx and UPS, which I think you can see on the map, a mile inside the airport. Uh, we actually have some people riding there. Uh, the alternatives, I'm not sure. We're, we're in contact with the employers to explore what might be done. Scenario A keeps the frequencies the same as today, every 20 minutes daily. Scenario B restores Route 515 to high frequency status 15 minute frequency Monday through Saturday. I want to point out that gives much better connections with the Metro Orange Line operating every 15 minutes. The next slide, please. Okay. American Boulevard Station or 98th Street Station routes. Route 535, Lindale Avenue, 94th Street, James Avenue branches in Bloomington are eliminated and replaced by. New Route 534 via Lindale Avenue between American Boulevard, 98th Street stations. This route offers better service, frequency, and span over Route 535 today. Peak every 20 minutes, off peak every 30. We'll divert peak trips via 94th Street, James Avenue for continued service to Central Bloomington Industrial Area. Route 553 is a rush hour commuter bus operating just a trip now. It's extended via Lindale 
99th uh, to 102nd and over to Portland Avenue. It's this minor route change that gives us a connection at South Bloomington Transit Center. Next slide, the slide of uh, 76th Street American Boulevard route. Now 535 also runs on 76th Street, 77th Street north of the 494. It also runs on American Boulevard, and these branches go between Lindale and Penn Avenues. Uh, they provide a lot of access around South Sound and the businesses around the freeways. They're eliminated, Route 535 that is, replaced by existing Route 540, 76, 77th Street, Crosstown, but with improved service on Route 540. Every 20 minutes peak and every 30 minutes off peak. Connects to 76th Street Station at the Orange Line. So those people get back and forth. Our existing Route 538 runs on Knox Avenue and through South Town. It has peak service every 30 minutes. And we have uh, suspended right now Route 542, American Boulevard, and that's being revived with new service uh, in even the basic plan. And it's a direct American Boulevard route every 30 minutes in the peak. The more direct route allows us to extend the route west on the far left end of the map to West 78th Street, Edina, which uh, offers new coverage to uh, some businesses along the north side of 494. Route 538 uh, keeps offering it the way it does today. Under scenario B, Route 538 uh, gets improved to a 30 minute midday service. But the big change is Route 542 that I just mentioned is upgraded considerably to operate every 30 to 60 minutes in all off peak hours, including weekends. So that's a, a big change there for connections. Next slide, please. Uh, the 98th Street station, used to be South Bloomington. Uh, Route 535 is a 98th Street branch today to Normandale College. It's eliminated and replaced by a redesigned Route 539 in red, the east-west route on 98th Street. Mall of America, but west of 35W, it's remodeled to become a direct route 98th to Normandale College and Normandale Village. Straight cross town route. An AM peak where the school day start at Normandale will run every 20 minutes to make sure it's easy to get to class. Most other routes will run every 30 minutes. Weekends will run every 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, this gives improved frequency daily in this corridor. I should mention Normandale College has contributed over 100 commuters per day during the school year to Route 535. So a direct well-timed route by 98th Street is one of our essential goals. Now Route 539 goes a lot of different places west of 35W today. Penn Avenue from South Town, Old Shakopee Road, France Avenue. And these segments are mostly replaced by new Route 536, which goes north-south west of 35W. You see it there on Penn Avenue from, Old, uh, from uh, American Boulevard Station uh, by South Town, Penn Avenue, Old Shakopee Road, direct to where the people ride quite a bit the Valley West area, which is France, Normandale College. We run every 30 minutes in the peak, off peak every 30 to 60. Now there's an impact here. Uh, there's no service on West 90th Street in this concept plan. Uh, in 2019, we had about nine daily riders. Most of these were walking distance from Penn, but some riders at France Avenue would have no service. There's an apartment building there. With scenario B, Route 536 is improved in the midday every 30, but much more significantly, we revive now suspended Route 537, which goes Valley West, France Avenue, Normandale College, and up to Southdale. And it would be a 30 minute peak frequency, 60 minute midday. And this gives an alternative for 90th in France. On the finally, the next slide, the last in my series here, 98th Street Station, other routes. Route 597, the nonstop express between 98th Street and downtown Minneapolis, in the past been used by many commuters. Uh, it is now replaced by the Metro Orange Line between 98th Street and downtown. Slightly longer trip, but a consistent high frequency, 10 minute frequency on the Orange Line. 
A lot of the riders have been riding on the local branches of the 597, which are shown in the replaced now in the lower left corner or the west side. Route 547 is replacement for 597 CE branches, uh, Old Shakopee Road in that area. Uh, 30 minute peak service did about 150 commuters last year in that area. That included about 30 reverse commuters going to the Southwest Bloomington industrial area. There's over a thousand day jobs there. Uh, Route 548 would replace the West 102nd Street branch of 597. The route would be modified to serve Highland Greens Drive apartments there west of Normandale, not Normandale Village, not 98th Street, which is covered now by Route 539. And the route would continue in 102nd Street east of Xerxes as a change, direct service to uh, 98th Street Station. Now we also have a 30 minute peak service and about 110 commuters were riding that branch last year. So people have good access from Southwest Bloomington, but it's a slightly longer travel time when you factor in the transfer at the 98th Street Station. And that's all I have on the details. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. Um, appreciate you walking us through the details. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's important that we understand not only the changes that are being proposed, but the impacts of these proposed changes, especially on communities of color and those who are experiencing poverty. So we start by reviewing maps that show where black, indigenous, and people of color, as well as low-income communities live in the study area. On these maps, we wanna pay particular attention to the green dots because that's where um, low income and black indigenous people of color are living in the study area. On these maps, one dot equals 50 people, which means that this data is uh, shown by census block is, is in significant detail. Next slide, please. Since this project does meet the council's definition of a major service change, the Federal Transit Administration requires us to conduct a formal service equity analysis to determine if the proposed changes potentially have a disparate impact or disproportionate burden. So uh, one note here, uh, here at the council, we prefer to use more inclusive language such as communities of color. But for this specific slide, I will use the FTA terminology of minority and, and non-minority. The map in the upper right shows the change in the number of weekly trips. So green means more trips, purple means less trips. Please keep in mind that the colors on the map are not at all tied to demographics. We need to also consider the maps that were on the previous slide, which show where people who rely on transit the most live in order to have a more complete picture. The FTA allows each region to determine its own threshold for disparate impact. So our benchmark is 80%. This isn't a hard line, but rather a goal that includes indicates if additional work is needed in order to interpret or explain the results or to mitigate the impacts. In this situation, the average study area resident will see an increase in service. So the question on the table is really whether low-income minority communities are seeing at least 80% of the increase in service that more affluent and white areas will receive. And the results show that we are at or above the 80% mark. However, digging into the data a little more highlights some of the limitations of the methodology. For example, the methodology uses census data, which assumes that the only people who are riding a route live along the route. Um, it doesn't factor in trips to jobs, other key destinations for people who live elsewhere and are transferring to that route. Also, uh, percentages can be misleading, uh, for example, John mentioned the restoration of two routes that are currently suspended, the 537 and the 542. Both of those in this analysis are showing at 100% uh, increases, which may also influence the calculations. Next slide. So in order to better understand how the proposed changes <clears throat> will improve access to jobs in the study area, we have mapped areas with a a change in the number of jobs that can be increased within 45 minutes under this proposal. 
there's lots of green in the study area on both the uh, rush hour and the midday map, which indicates a significant increase in jobs in Bloomington, Ridgefield, Edina, and Burnsville. Next slide, please. It is also important for us to better understand who can access these jobs. So this bar chart shows that everyone will see an increase in the number of jobs they can access on transit compared to today's baseline, regardless of race or income. However, the tallest columns are for black, indigenous, people of color, and low income groups. They will benefit more, especially in the midday or off peak. Next slide. Our focus now shifts from having developed the proposal to getting the word out about the proposed changes using a variety of approaches listed here, uh, both virtual or online and in person. Um, our public comment period starts today and extends until February 22nd. Um, our key uh, tool for getting feedback from customers will be a map-based survey, which we will have translated, which is translated into both Spanish and Somali as well as English. Um, we are going to also uh, be out on the street doing some in-person intercepts, of course, following social distancing uh, rules. And we want to make sure that we are hearing from a diverse set of riders. Um, and also keeping in mind that right now, not everyone who um, is interested in these routes is actually riding with us due to the pandemic. There's four different ways that the public can, can weigh in. Um, we'll have uh, two community meetings and a public hearing. Those will all be virtual. The meeting formats will be exactly the same. It's just one has a legal designation. Also completing the survey. Um, there's a, an email address um, on our project website, and also there's a phone number listed for the council's public comment line. Uh, and with this, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, questions, Council Member Chambliss. Yeah, those are um, really interesting uh, presentations, uh, Shauna, in a different way than, than we're used to seeing it. Um, it's good to see the demographics and also where the jobs are. Um, I know that some people are willing to travel to get to uh, a job, even if they don't live in a particular neighborhood. So I was kind of glad that you mentioned that, um, you know, this study may not be capturing or focusing in on those people that are coming through the area. But um, I also know that sometimes there's a gap between where the jobs are and people's ability to obtain those jobs or even have an interest in those jobs. So information about jobs is really critical if we want to, you know, kind of allow the, the intersection of transportation to jobs to locality. So if we could um, include in the engagement questions about for example, maybe uh, if there were jobs near you, would you be interested if there were transportation, op additional transportation options to those jobs? And uh, would you be interested in finding out, um, I don't know, maybe there, there could be career fairs. I'm not sure, but I think information is really important as we look at our transportation opportunities and closing some gaps, especially when it comes to areas that have high poverty. So just something to think about um, and potentially some opportunities that we have to look at things differently so that we can close some of those gaps. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for that feedback. I think that's, that's great. And um, I see that Robin Kaufman is still on the call. Um, Robin and her team are leading up our outreach and engagement for this. And so um, I'm confident that Robin will make sure that message gets back. All right, additional questions or comments from council members? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Barbara, I, this is uh, council member Sterner. I, I just had a maybe another comment um, and possibly a question as well. Go ahead, Councilmember Sterner. Thank you. And, and I and I and I'm uh, three of my four communities are opt-out communities, uh, and I, I know uh, Minnesota Valley Transit uh, did, decided not to be part of the study. 
So I do know you mentioned part of burns though, but uh, we're dealing with 30% uh, uh, of the people are people of color in Burnsville without, with also one of the larger area of the Ethiopian population. And so I know we mentioned the orange line coming to Burnsville, but I just wanna make sure in the future studies and doing the job creation, it's very important that Burnsville has consistent uh, transportation uh, uh, going up like you know, Richfield would have or Bloomington you know, for that matter. And then the red line needs to be have some kind of connectivity with that as well, you know, coming from Apple Valley. So yeah, thanks for the study, but I, the future, I hope we can continue to kind of build the whole region into it, including our Dakota County into the orange line and the red line. Great, thank you. All right, any additional questions or comments? I have a quick one, just uh, um, just knowing the south side of the metro pretty well, and just I really am impressed with the detailed plan of really connecting, uh, making the, the getting the orange line orange line connected with where people need to go, whether it's along American Boulevard. I love that it's going all the way over to 169, um, and the connections to Normandale. Um, I think that it feels from what what we're seeing, and even where you. Uh, laid out your job map that you're really lining people with the destinations to that they need to get to. So we're, you know, we can really um, utilize the orange line to really get people where they need to be. So I was very impressed. Yeah. All right. Anything else from anyone? All right. Thank you, Cindy and John. Is there anything else from council members this evening? Council member Fredson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, reflecting on our decision to put item uh, uh, number six that was on the uh, non-consent agenda, that's 2021-26. Uh, I would request that we put that on the uh, non-consent agenda for the full council. Okay, so items number one and six will go non-consent to council. As long as everyone, you all agree? Did you get that, Jenna? Yes, I got that. All right, thank you. All right, anything else from council members tonight? All right, having our business concluded, then we can be adjourned. Thank you all, have a good night.